Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I'm your host, Sean Needham, and I am super excited to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, um, menopause and weight loss. And we are waiting for Jennifer Woodward to, to connect with her so we can get her on the show and, and, and talk with her. She is a... Um, a holds a master of science in, in integrating nutrition and is a certified functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner and a board certified wellness coach. And I'm super excited to have her on regarding this subject. <coughs> Excuse me, I had to sneeze. So sorry about that. Um, the smoke and the and the uh, um, air this year has just been super mad on my allergies the last few days. So. Um, so let's first start out with defining what the different stages of menopause. So there's premenopause, there's perimenopause, and there's postmenopause. And postmenopause, the the little definition of postmenopause is that you haven't had a cycle that a woman hasn't had a cycle for twelve months. That's the definition of postmenopause. And um, but I will say this. Uh, that doesn't mean that you won't cycle again. Um, I've heard many a times where, you know, women haven't cycled for 12 months, 18 months, and then all of a sudden they have a cycle. So just because you're definitely, you're, you're, you're technically postmenopause is not mine. You might not cycle again, as long as you still have your ovaries. Um, and you've have, you haven't had an oophorectomy, which is also known as a hysterectomy, um, the way they take out your ovaries also. Um, so that would be postmenopause. And um, Jennifer, welcome to our show. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Morning. I am defining to them right now um, peri, post, and premenopause. So I'm in the middle of, of postmenopause right now. And um, I'll let you introduce yourself here shortly as I finish up the uh, definitions of, of, of those. So um, postmenopause, when you're when you have a cycle for 12 months or more. And then um, premenopause is basically that, you know, you're cycling normally. Usually that's not maybe not always the case. Um, uh, and that doesn't mean that you might not have some cycling issues like, you know, headaches or migraines that follow your cycle or, um, you know, painful periods or PMS. When you're, P when you're perimen premenopause, you might still have that. Perimenopause is between premenopause and between postmenopause. Yes. It's usually when your cycles start become more irregular. Mm -hmm. you might skip cycles. They might be short. You might have two cycles in a month. Um, that is definition of perimenopause. And I will tell you from a pharmacist standpoint, when you're trying to balance somebody's hormones, perimenopause is the most difficult <laughs> because you're irregular. So it's hard to know where you're at in your cycle when you're trying to dose hormones. So that's a little bit of background on, on menopause. Um, Jennifer, I did introduce you um, just briefly. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself, though. Thanks, John. Good morning, everyone. Hello, I'm Jennifer Woodward. So I'm a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. I have my master's in integrative nutrition, and I do work with women in perimenopause. So as Sean was saying, that is a really complicated time in life. It's kind of been a natural transition for me as I worked with women just with hormone issues in general and naturally transition toward this very confusing time in life where women are in you know that age 35 to 50 or so and wondering what is going on with their hormones. So that is what I I do in my private practice. I do some independent contract work for other um, practitioners. And then I do run a division at Functional Diagnostic Nutrition, the business school part of FDN. So I've got my hand in a lot of places in the functional world, and I just am very passionate about this topic. So thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for being on. Uh, one common thing we get often um, is you know, will, will hormones help me lose weight? Um, you know, because in perimenopause, menopause, weight gain can be an issue. So you go. Absolutely. Okay. So here is my caveat. Every woman in perimenopause, I, I mean, okay, let's say 98% of the women in perimenopause are looking to lose a little bit of weight because perimenopause is characterized that 15 year period 
with a weight gain of between five and 11 pounds. So women can change nothing. They can continue the diet that they're eating. They can continue the exercise regimen that they've been doing for the last, you know, 20 years. And all of a sudden in perimenopause, this weight starts to creep on. And it really freaks a lot of women out. They're like, uh, what is going on with my body? And so, you know, they, they consider maybe going on bioidentical hormones thinking maybe I need a little bit more estrogen. Maybe I need a little bit more progesterone or testosterone because we hear this party line that testosterone can really rev up the metabolism, help women retain their lean muscle mass, thereby allowing them to lose weight. So I have a, a, a couple different, um, ideas on this as functional practitioners. Of course we test and we do not guess. And so if women are going in, into their practitioner and they are getting their levels of hormones actually tested, including progesterone ladies. A lot of, a lot of practitioners will put, um, you know, women on estrogen only estradiol only. And without that protective counter effect of progesterone, the estrogen could possibly be doing more harm than good. So am I a proponent of bioidentical hormone therapy? I am in certain cases, as long as we are testing and not guessing. I can definitely keep talking about, <laughs> I can definitely keep talking about hormone yeah, replacement. No, uh, um, I, I, I just missed a button there. Um, <laughs> and that was great. And I love, and I always want to, uh, you know, piggyback off of that is that yes, commonly it's estrogen. They prescribe when, when traditional practitioners, when they think of women and hormones, they think of estrogen and they so often forget about progesterone. Mm -hmm. Well, oftentimes, like I love your term, test, not guess. As many years as I've been doing this, I've never heard that. And I love that. I'm going to steal that if you don't mind. Please. please <laughs> yeah. Um, if they did test and didn't guess, they would find out with perimenopausal women that um, normally their estrogen is fine. Their progesterone is low. Um, and that's what's causing them to start their cycles to start become more irregular, but they put them on estrogen and sometimes things get worse. Mm -hmm. So progesterone is very important during, during um, perimenopause and postmenopause, premenopause too. But um, during perimenopause, progesterone is what is causing a lot of the issues when it comes to anytime there's a cycling issue. And that's kind of when perimenopause um, we start looking at it or thinking about it because the cycles start becoming more ir irregular. That's from progesterone dropping off. So you don't need estrogen. You usually need progesterone. Yes, that is 100% correct. So that truly is the, the one of the characterizations of perimenopause is that wildly fluctuating level of estrogen can start to pop up, you know, in our late 30s, early 40s, sometimes if you're lucky, you know, your early 50s. But truly, it is that decline in progesterone that women are suffering from with perimenopause. They just don't realize it. Um, Dr. Geraldine Pryor, Dr. Lara Bryden, and of course, Dr. John Lee, um, great proponents of, of truly progesterone only therapy in perimenopause and even beyond. So there really is a lot of therapeutic effect of progesterone on women as they're struggling through, through that time of perimenopause. When estrogen levels are elevated, you know, we're not just talking about endogenous estrogen levels that the body's creating. We're also having to deal with the effects of environmental estrogen and estrogens in our food. So it can really be compounded in women. You can test for your estrogen levels, you know, that your body's producing or converting. However, we are still being, you know, kind of bombarded by estrogens in our environment. So I see a lot of women who are suffering from what we call estrogen dominance just because they've got that inside and outside estrogen with that really, really low progesterone. And one of the reasons is women have been on birth control for years and years and years, shutting down ovulation, thereby shutting down their body's production of progesterone. So it can just get to be a really soupy mess in perimenopause. Yeah, absolutely. And so then tell us the uh, the weight loss issue, because we, we get that question a lot when it comes to perimenopause and postmenopause. Yep. And I'm sure, I'm sure lots of practitioners get this question because so many women are dealing with such a frustrating, again, this, this weight, weight gain that comes almost out of nowhere. What happens in perimenopause, this is what I tell my clients all the time. We have this, this kind of catching up of all of the things that we women, we, we overachieving, you know, type a perfectionistic women have been compounding now for, for decades, you know, for years, we've pushed ourselves through, um, you know, not enough sleep, probably over exercising, maybe over dieting, certainly not getting enough nutrients or, or just general nutrition. 
overstressing. You know, there are just so many, so many ways that women will push themselves and bodies can respond quite well in our twenties, in our thirties. But if a woman is, you know, undernourished particularly, and has been on birth control for, you know, a period of time, we just have this, this, the body's being robbed of progesterone essentially. So progesterone again, is that really that balancing, um, uh, balancing hormone and too high levels of estrogen in the body can affect weight gain in a few different ways. Number one, estrogen, too much estrogen in the body. Now, you know, estrogen is bound up in our fat tissue, number one. So the more, the more body fat we're carrying, the more estrogen can affect the body because it's a steroid based hormone. It's, it's bound up in our fat tissue. And when estrogen is, is highly bound, it also recirculates in the body. I see a lot of women who have impaired digestion, and this doesn't just start in the colon or the small intestine. It really starts in the liver and gallbladder. So if a woman is not eating a diet that's appropriate, if she's over relying on coffee and alcohol and sugar, the liver and the gallbladder start to become impaired. The liver stops producing sufficient bile and the gallbladder stops, you know, using sufficient bile compounded on this women, a lot of women, you know, in their thirties and forties are getting their gallbladders removed. So we have this breakdown in bile metabolism and the way the body can actually use bile. And, you know, probably everyone has suffered from the stomach flu and, and, you know, thrown up what's referred to as bile, kind of that green liquid, but the liver, the body uses that to break down emulsify fats and allow you to extract fat soluble nutrients from your food. So when bile metabolism is impaired, the body actually can't get rid of estrogen because you have to actually, you have to poop out excess estrogen in the body to get rid of it. And if you're not, you know, eliminating regularly and your bile flow is impaired, then the estrogen starts compounding in the tissue and can put on weight. Estrogen is a growth hormone. You know, we women around age 12, 13, 14 really start producing lots of estrogen. That's what gives us, you know, our hips and our breasts. It's a, it's a growth mm -hmm. hormone, but in our thirties and forties, we don't want to grow anymore. Right. right, right. <laughs> That starts putting yeah. on a little bit more hippiness, you know, a little bit more in the in the midsection. Um, absolutely, what women don't want. So I work with my ladies to to increase bile flow. That's kind of the number one way that we um, will help reduce some of that excess estrogen, which can cause the weight. And then we also have to focus on, you know, really really dialing in macronutrients. And some women are like, ah, macronutrients. Like I don't I don't even know what those are. Let alone like why do I have to track them? But we're talking about carbohydrates, fat, and protein, of course. And what I see in my women, you know, over 800 of them, we've seen that women are under eating dietary protein, specifically animal protein, and they're really overeating either, either carbohydrates or fat or both, right? The work of do not tell the keto people that. <laughs> I'm sorry to all the keto people, um, but you know, it, in my practice, I really advocate for in, like an ancestral nutrition practice, right? Like, what what were your ancestors eating? They were not they, they were not imbalanced in their diet because they were seeking to optimize energy, right? They were seeking to to uh, fuel the body to do the work that was required of them. We require less work now because we're I'm sitting here at my computer. You know, I'll be on my yeah. computer most of the day. I just don't need as much as you know my great 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 grandmother in Poland. Right. But I still need to make sure that, gosh, my, my protein is key because again, let me, let me reference this work of Dr. Ted Naiman, also Marty Kendall, brilliant engineer who does a lot of work in optimizing. I've interviewed Marty. Oh, 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 lucky. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, and your listeners are familiar. So in his, um, on, on his website, he does have a fantastic article where he went into, you know, the data he's got from tens of thousands of people who've gone through his program. And one of the, my favorite statistics he pulled out is that if one can optimize protein and if one specifically can optimize the mineral potassium, so over 4,700 milligrams, which is the RDA, his research, research shows that on average, people will eat 43% less calories than they normally would by optimizing protein and potassium. So if you're looking at the average American woman who's, you know, running around kids in the morning, running to her job, coming home at 4 p.m., pouring herself a big glass of wine because she's so stressed out. She skipped breakfast. She skipped lunch. She's going to start overeating at dinner and pulling in the goldfish because she hasn't planned dinner. You know, she is she is not optimizing her protein. She's certainly opt not optimizing her potassium because the body's wasting those, those really, those stress managing minerals because the whole day is built around, you know, stressful things. So there's a lot going on with weight gain in women around perimenopause. And those are just some of the things that we'll work on with, with, you know, clients. Um, 
to make sure that, you know, weight can fall off naturally, not with keto, not with ozempic, good heavens, you know, just, just naturally optimizing the body's metabolism. Yeah. And I mean, you kind of, I'm going to sum up what I heard (laughs) and and I've heard it over and over again is gut health is important. Mm -hmm. You basically said that. And, you know, without that, we can't absorb our nutrients appropriately. And some nutrients we absorb too much, like you're talking about the estrogen, which basically is inter interhepatic recycling. You're, Mm -hmm. you're, you're reabsorbing it from when you're trying to break it down you're reabsorbing it. And sometimes you don't need that much estrogen. Um, especially if you don't have enough progesterone to offset the estrogen. Right. And then um, dietary issues and maximizing protein. Now, when we talk about macros, I think we make it too complicated. And, and, and one of the analogies, you know, like, oh, I don't want to, like you say, I don't want to track macros. And <clears throat> one of the analogies I like to give or, or the scenario I like to give is like when, an, when, a, when a lion is about to attack a gazelle, does – he or she, she says, most of the, most of the female lions are the ones that hunt. Does the lion say, gee, I wonder how much protein's in that gazelle. <laughs> I wonder how much carbohydrates and fat is in that gazelle. No. Um, they just eat real food. So basically, and you kind of alluded to it a little bit when you said, especially animal protein. Um, if you focus on eating animal protein and you eat meat first. So if you're sitting down at the table and you've got potatoes and vegetables and, and some kind of meat source, if you eat meat first, I I don't like making guarantees, but I almost guarantee you, you will not overeat other things. Um, very true. Yeah. Um, I do that in my diet. Um, and meat is very satiating. It's just, you know, it's very satiating. It makes, it makes you feel full. So all of a sudden you don't want that extra scoop of mashed potatoes or Mm -hmm. that extra scoop of vegetables. And regardless if vegetables and fruit are not necessarily bad for us, I get it, but they are extra calories. Right. So maximize your protein and, um, you, you will, you will be satiated sooner. A hundred percent. And I think that's so important. And one of the things that, you know, Kendall teaches us, of course, in his research, um, and also Dr. Ted Naiman, you know, we're not just looking at the satiation factor of protein as a macronutrient. I really like to dive into the, the micronutrients. The work of Dr. Georgia Ede is fantastic on this. Her website is Diagnosis Diet. I trained with her and she has a cool breakdown on a, she's got an article on her website, meet the ultimate superfood question mark. And she's got a graph on there showing how many vitamins and minerals red meat has, it actually outranks a lot of fruits and vegetables. And the cool thing about animal products is we've got bioavailable nutrients, right? A lot of times in our plants, we've got things that block nutrient absorption, like oxalates, um, you know, and and this is why a lot of my clients actually, I'll take them off salads. If they come to me and they're like, I'm bloated all the time and I can't digest anything and my stomach hurts. And I'm like, well, what are you eating? They're like, oh, uh, a salad every day for lunch. I'm like, well, that's great. You're getting your, you're getting your nutrients but actually your, your body's not loving that salad, right? It's creating more inflammation in your gut than it is giving your nutrients. So transitioning over to that really bioavailable, nutrient-dense, animal-based diet. Again, it's not just the protein that we're looking at. Man, we've got potassium, magnesium, sodium, calcium, even in, in animal products, right? We're looking at iron and selenium and all of these beautiful, wonderful, smaller components of you know, of of food, but particularly animal products that increase satiation. Because when you think about the physiological natural drive for hunger, what are we trying to do? We're trying to feed and fuel our body. It's a, it's a biological drive. And so I tell my clients, if you are constantly craving food, if you're always hungry and all you're doing is going to the pantry and eating Oreos and drinking wine and eating, you know, like apples, your body's missing all of these nutrients. And so it's going to continue to seek out. It's going to continue to hunt just like that lioness, right? But the problem is we've got constant access to all this crappy food. It's not, it's not a deer that we're eating, you know? And so our body's like, well, I need more. I need more because I need all of the nutrients that is, you know, that are present in that deer. So again, that's the work of of Dr. Ted Naiman, the protein to energy hypothesis that essentially says that our bodies are biologically programmed to seek out a set number of protein grams every single day before we can achieve that satiation and stop, stop looking for food. 
Yeah, and speaking of nutrients in meat, um, you, you mentioned iron, but I just want to go into that a little bit. There is no, I'm going to I'm going to reiterate this, there is no better source of iron than red meat. I, I don't care what kind of plants you eat that are rich in iron. None of them are as rich in the absorbable iron, the heme iron that is in red meat. Red meat is red because it's full of iron. Iron, when it's oxidized, turns red. And that's why red meat is red. There's no better way to increase your iron stores than, than, than red meat. And I think you're right. There's many times when we are craving something and so we keep, and we're hungry because we're craving a certain nutrient. So we eat more. Um, quick story. Um, I had a, a patient that was, he um, had low iron stores. He was uh, he was anemic, and you could tell when I when I saw him. And I sent him to a a naturopathic doctor. And one of the things we found out about was that his his traditional doctor, because he had a tr his traditional doctor, was telling him to limit his red meat and limit his egg consumption because they're dangerous and can cause heart attacks. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, right. <laughs> we all know that that is a complete lie. If that's the case, um, we would have been wiped off the earth many, many generations ago from eating red meat and eggs, which was a staple in our diet for thousands of years. So the naturopath told him, it's like, he's like, well, he, he's like, well, you need to start eating red meat. And he goes, oh, just out of the blue, he's like, good, because I really crave red meat. <laughs> Of course he does. Your body's telling you something, right? Yes. I tell you, um, I, I I often challenge people, and and you know this is still an open challenge. I'm not making any guarantee because I very rarely do that, but I often challenge people. I dare you to eat too much red meat in a day. Mm. You are having caloric intake issues, like you and you want to lose weight. I dare you to eat too much red meat a day now. You can focus on more lean red meats if you are super, super conscious with calories. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I just, you know, I'm, I'm pretty active when it comes to um, biking and mountain bike racing and things. And I rarely can eat more than 12 ounces of red meat at a sitting, you know, which is only, you know, depending on how much fat, it's only 500 to 800 calories. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, think about that. Mm -hmm. and, and then I'm satisfied for, eight, 10, 12, 16 hours sometimes, depending on what my activity was that day. So mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, a hundred percent. Are you familiar with uh, the work of Dr. Blake Donaldson? He was a practicing physician in the 1960s in New York. So he, he wrote this book called Strong Medicine. It's not available in print anymore, but you can find a free copy on the internet, a PDF form. I love his work. So what Dr. Donaldson did, he was he a was physician to the rich and famous in New York. He practiced in Park Avenue in the 1960s. And he was having all of these patients come to him. And they were overweight. And they had diabetes. And they had edema. And they had you know low energy. And these were like the cream of the crop of, of a New York society. So they were they could afford this doctor. And they thought they'd go in and you know get medicine and have this really you know it, it really robust treatment plan. But what Dr. Blake Donaldson did for his patients is he put them on a diet of what he called fresh fat meat. He told them to eat red meat and red meat only three times a day, and to come back to him when they could no longer pinch any fat above their midsection, and when all of their symptoms were gone. And he has anecdotal story after anecdotal story in his book, Strong Medicine, where he pulls, you know, he, he he basically cures disease. You know, I'm not a doctor. I can't diagnose, treat, or prescribe. You can't, Sean, but I just work in the functional coaching space. And so using this amazing tool of just food, you know, a, this, this really important doctor was just using red meat, no medication, no supplements even. He just put all of these, you know, chubby housewives and high performing businessmen on a fresh fat meat diet three times a day. And lo and behold, it cured, it had a hundred percent cure rate. I mean, these are the stories in his book. There might've been people he didn't talk about in his book, but it's a fascinating piece of history that shows how effective specifically red meat. He did not put his patients on a diet of chicken or salmon. He put them on red meat and it is so transformative and so healing for so many people that it's just one of my it's one of my favorite you know tools i have my clients read that book and tell them this is why i'm um, you know recommending it for you this is a doctor right <laughs> who's saying this is totally fine for you to have like 
Yes, we can worry a little bit about cholesterol or heart issues if they run in the family, of course, but also, you know, for women particularly in perimenopause, do keep in mind that both high estrogen levels and low estrogen levels can have negative effects on, on the heart, right? On the cardiovascular system and on, on the brain, you know, if estrogen levels are, are too high or too low, it can lead to neurodegeneration. And so it really behooves us at this time in perimenopause to eat well, to nourish ourselves well, to set the stage for a proper steroid hormone synthesis because progesterone and estrogen need enough essential fatty acids in order to synthesize in the body. They have a cholesterol backbone. So eating that, you know, fresh fat meat, that red meat can actually help women create their own progesterone, their own testosterone, their own cortisol, and their own melatonin. And if your levels are high in all those, um, you know, really vital hormones, you are going to sail through perimenopause much better than the average American woman. Absolutely. And that just means just uh, focus on ribeye. Ribeye is good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, ribeye is my favorite cut of cut of red meat that's for sure Me too, actually so, <laughs> beef. um well one thing it's actually speaking of nutrients in red meat it's actually pretty amazing and really almost unexplainable no matter how scientific we are <clears throat> that a cow can literally eat mostly grass and they can take the energy in grass, and I think the numbers are three to one, they take the amount of calories they eat in grass and turn it into three times the calories on their body weight. That's incredible. That disobeys physics is what it does. Um, but they assimilate all those nutrients that they get from plants and they put them into their muscle and fat stores. So when we eat that red meat, we are essentially getting all the benefits of the plants that that herbivore, that cow ate. I love that. Truly a God-given gift, right? That is it is. I mean, that's the <laughs> only way you can explain it. You cannot explain it scientifically. Oh, that is amazing. And that actually that begs a point too for a lot of women who have been told, hey, go plant-based, go vegan. You know, plants are where it's at for you for weight loss and hormone balance. Let's consider the fact of, you know, that a ruminant, hat, like a cow, the pH balance of a cow's stomach is somewhere between four and six. As a human, you know, our pH balance in our stomach ought to be somewhere between 0.8 and 2.4 on that pH scale. We have a very acidic stomach, right? We are designed to break down heavier matter, protein specifically. That is where protein digestion yep. begins, you know, in the stomach. Um, and so I see a lot of women, you know, they're suffering from bloating and constipation and diarrhea and distension and bloating and gas, you know, GERD, right? Gastroesophageal reflux, acid reflux. And I ask them, you know, what are, what are you eating? They're like, well, my doctor put me on a plant-based diet. I quinoa for breakfast. I did salad for lunch and a plant-based dinner. I'm like, that is great. That's better probably than the average American. Right. However, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so, you know, a woman on a plant-based diet, her stomach acid is going to become progressively more alkaline, which impedes her ability to break down protein. So if a woman's like, well, I have a hard time breaking down red meat. Like my, it just sits in my stomach. It hurts my stomach. I will tell them, well, you've trained your body to do that. And you didn't know it's not like it's your fault. Right. But that's, that's biologically what is happening. And so using some digestive enzymes, using some betaine hydrochloric acid, as long as we're testing and you don't have like H. pylori, which can exacerbate, um, you know, the, that, that alkaline stomach, um, we can really start to optimize digestion so you can break down that protein. So if you're listening to Sean's show and you're like, well, I'm, you know, I can't eat meat, you know, consider number one, having your gut tested, doing something like a GI map where we can look for pancreatic elastase, we can look for markers of digestion, um, digestive insufficiency, or consider using a digestive enzyme and slowly weaning and training your body toward more, um, you know, better digestion. So you can break down that red meat because it is so healing and so important. Absolutely. And um, as you said, Jennifer, our, our stomachs are meant to be acidic. So these people that are on Zantac or Tagament, um, H2 antagonists or PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, Prilosec, Prevacid, you know, all the time because they have that reflux, um, that is in the long term going to make your reflux worse <clears throat> because your digestion is going to be worse. So um, 
I, you know, if we've talked about that subject many times on our podcast, go back and look at previous episodes. If you want to find out how bad PPIs are for you long term and hurting your digestion, um, our stomachs are meant to be acidic and to break down foods appropriately and have proper digestion. We have to have acidic stomachs going back on the bloating issue mm-hmm. on a plant based diet or bloating in, in, in particular. Um, well, it's no wonder you feel bloated when you're eating lots and lots of fiber and you can't digest it. And remember, we're not a rumen animal. Just like you said, we're not a cow. We're not a deer that can break down grass because our stomachs are built differently. Um, I know there's a big argument out there there about fiber, and I'm not saying don't eat no fiber, but um, I think that, you know, we can't eat as much fiber as uh, uh, an animal that is made to eat grass. I mean, we just can't, and that's going to cause bloating. It's going to bring water into our into our intestinal tract, and it's going to cause a lot of bloating because we can't literally digest it. We we literally cannot digest plant based fiber, which is cellulose. It is undigestible by us. Um, cows can do it, and cows can assimilate the nutrients because they have the special um, ruminant. And actually, actually, what that is is it's. They have special bacteria in their gut that actually help to break down that cellulose product, which is also known as undigestible fiber. So that's why, you know, we can't break it down. And really, animal-based protein is the best way for us to get nutrients, period. I will stress that over and over again. And it is not dangerous. It does not cause heart attacks. Let's just be rational about it. If it did, just think about it. What did our ancestors eat? Our answers didn't mostly eat plants. You tell me a you tell me a culture that survived on plants alone. I'm waiting. Right. I mean, seriously. Now I will tell you cultures that that's that um, survived on mostly animal based products. Look at anybody in northern latitudes. Scandinavians, yeah, they had potatoes too in the summer. But you look at look at Eskimos, the Intuit population. Did did, did they have a lot of a lot of greens? Did they have a lot of salad? Did they have a lot of spinach? Probably not, if any. My my wife would argue, who is much smarter than me, she would argue that they did because of trading, that there was somebody that probably traded with them and, and gave them some kind of plants or fruits. Mostly whale blubber, seal blubber, fish, um, and they would also kill, you know, uh, caribou, whatever, moose, whatever is up there in the north and, and um, you know, focus on mostly meat because that's, that's what they, that's what they had. They didn't have, you know, one of the disadvantages of what's happened over the last hundred years is that we have mass transportation. So you can have an apple in Northern Alaska any time of the year or spinach for that matter. Um, that used to not happen. And, you know, refrigeration, you couldn't store it. You know, you had to eat you, the plants you you picked that day and ate that day or mostly or maybe within a few days or they would spoil. So, right? A hundred percent. Oh, the wheels are just turning because you were saying all of the things that are just so important for, for people to hear. I mean, um, I always tell my clients, your granny wasn't out foraging for no kale, <laughs> right? Like she just, that wasn't calorically expedient, wasn't nutrient dense food. So, I mean, just naturally, it's not like people, no one had the internet, no one had like books on nu- nutrition 300 years ago, 200 years ago, but people just inherently knew what gave them energy, what right. made their digestion sharp, what made them feel good, what fed their children well. And, you know, you, you, Sean, just referencing, you know, the, the traditional cultures, right? I'm sure you talked about ad nauseum, the work of Dr. Weston A. Price, where he realized going over from culture to culture around the globe, right? So not just it, it, like everywhere, latitudinal, uh, longitudinal, we're talking Swiss Alps, we're talking equatorial, you know, um, uh, islands, and really the, the crux, the main thing that he found from a nutrient standpoint was that every traditional society untouched by what he calls white man's diet, um, you know, subsisted on animal products. That was the back backbone of their diet. So yes, plants were brought in as almost like an accoutrement. Like it was a, it was like a, a, you know, a relish, but it wasn't the backbone of, of traditional society's diet. So, you know, we look around and just see how sick and unwell everyone is. And we can definitely, like, if you just think about 
things in their most reductionistic, simple terms. Like what are we putting into our bodies? I'm not saying that plants are bad. Please do not hear me say that. I eat plants regularly. However, it's definitely, you know, not the backbone of, of a healthy diet, especially as you brought in just the beginning of this, this quick discussion here. If you're struggling with bloating, you cannot break down that indigestible fiber. And the other thing is for women, you know, we've got that slow bile flow or insufficient bile. We've got too much estrogen. We have, you know, a gut that's overrun by coffee and sugar and alcohol. And now we've got our, we have something in the body called the MMC, the migrating motor complex. And that's essentially that your, your body on autopilot will push through these waves in your, in your gut, right? Pushing through bacteria, which is important, pushing through food, which is also important, waste products. And if the body is exposed, if the diet has too much fiber in it, you're essentially like kind of blocking up a hose, right? You think about like a hose in your, in your sink, that's clogged with too much hair. It's the same thing happening. If we're eating too much fiber that blocks our migrating motor complex and the body can't effectively sweep things through. And so now we've got all this, you know, buildup in the gut that is increasing bloating because things are fermenting in your gut. Just think about like, you know, sourdough bread bubbling on the counter or, or beer or kombucha, right? The same thing is happening in your gut. So you, not only do you have the bloating, but you also have a lot of gas, which is not comfortable. So switching over to more of a, you know, animal-based diet and perimenopause can really cut down on a lot of those, those bloating symptoms. Absolutely. And speaking of kombucha, I got a, that was a tip for me to, uh, or a, a cue for me to, to uh, say good morning, Mark Keith. He's watching. And she just mentioned kombucha. I hope you heard that. Hey, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and Kelly Young, she uh, commented early on, hello all. Oh, hello, Kelly. She's one of our loyal listeners and viewers. And okay. Paul Nelson said, I appreciate your honesty and information. And that's about when we were talking about how important meat-based is over plant-based. And, you know, speaking of kale, um, you know, kale – really gets touted as being such a healthy, healthy um, nutrient or healthy plant. And I'm not saying to stay away from it totally. But when you look at it, you look at actually most vegetables, most vegetables are mostly water and kale is mostly water and kale doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it, honestly. Um, again, I'm not saying to completely stay away from plants. I'm just saying focus on, on a more of a meat-based diet. Now, I will say that if you are having certain inflammatory type issues, <clears throat> um, I would say stay away from plants and go with a red meat based only diet and start with that. And then you can add things later um, as your body heals. Because, um, yes, I do believe that we could live on red meat alone. Absolutely. I've interviewed Sean Baker. I, you know, I do believe we are omnivores, but I do believe that we become so sick with our standard American diet that there are just certain things we can't um, we can't eat. In, in, any anymore because our we we become so sick so um kale there is no way and i'm going to say this and, and actually well there is no way that you could survive on kale alone no way you could not eat enough kale and get enough calories in kale to survive alone there, there is no way um now let me just reiterate that with vegetables alone I really honestly think with vegetables alone, it's really, really hard to be healthy if you're eating vegetables alone. I'm not talking about sneaking Oreos. I'm not talking about, you know, these vegans that, you know, sneak, sneak all this other stuff, all this junk food. If you're eating truly, you know, whole foods and vegan only, I think it's very, very difficult. And you're not putting, you know, dressing on your salad and stuff like that. If you're eating just a plant-based diet, that's it. I think it's very, very difficult to be healthy and sustain yourself long term. And especially if you're active at all, there's just there's no way you're not going to get enough protein. Um, you're just not going to get an, an, enough nutrients. And I, and I will say one of the only diets and I know there's some haters out there. One of the only diets I, I, I recommend that you don't follow long term is is a vegan diet. Now, some people say, well, I went plant based diet only. And I lost weight. Well, of course you did. You were eating the standard American diet to begin with. Of course, you lost weight on the plant-based diet. But I think long-term, I just think the plant-based diet is not very sustaining. And we just need to be rational about that and think about the cultures before us. That's not what they did. No. And, and specifically, Sean, if you're thinking about like the perimenopausal woman who's having a harder time losing weight, women, we have to think about, you know, as Sean said, what is good long-term? It, it can be fine short-term. Like there's a lots of things that you can do for 
14 days, 28 days, two months. But when we think about longevity, when we think about what the body is actually going through and how we're feeding the body from a nutrient standpoint, it really starts to break down all of the arguments that are, you know, pro plant-based diet. When we think about our muscle, so in perimenopause, we start to break down, catabolize our own muscle and we start to have problems with, with weight gain. So what is your muscle made out of? You know, it's made out of amino acids. Amino acids are, they're, they're protein. It's, it, the amino acids come from protein foods. Yes, you can get incomplete amino acids from plant-based diet. And yes, you can combine together. So that's, that, that is an argument that's valid. However, they're not as bioavailable. Those amino acids are not as bioavailable as they are in animal products. So we need those amino acids, those proteins in order to build our skeletal muscle, also to build our neurotransmitters. Things like serotonin and dopamine, ladies, your happiness and joy neurotransmitters. Those are amino acid-based neurotransmitters. And so if you're struggling with depression and you're struggling with anxiety and you're not getting enough meat, it's going to have an impact on your brain. And then you get put on an antidepressant, you get put on Pristique or Lexapro, and that further leads to weight gain because now the body's apostat is is turned off and you start craving more foods and eating more foods. Your mitochondrial energy gets shut down. So you can't exercise as much. So amino acids are really important. And the other thing that, that, you know, animal foods provide us, as Sean said, ribeyes, ribeye over here every day, right? I mean, I wish I could have a ribeye every day. But we at the Woodward house, I have four kids. We eat red meat, I would say six times a week, you know, me and my four children and my husband, you know, when people come over to the Woodward house, they know that we're barbecuing steaks, we're doing hamburgers, like, and of course we want our, our, our meat to be quality, you know, to the best of your ability. So organic pastured grass fed, if you can. Um, but the other thing that meat has, especially red meat are essential fatty acids. It's already, it's already packaged with vitamin A, D, E, and K. Right. What is your progesterone made from? It's made from it's made from fat. It's got, yeah. like I said, a steroid, a cholesterol-based cholesterol backbone. Yep. Yep. We need that. Eat ribeye, sleep well, lose weight. Yeah. We vilify cholesterol, but without cholesterol, we would die. And I don't think, you know, we've talked about it many times before. I don't think cholesterol is what's causing cardiovascular disease in this country. That's a topic for a whole nother, uh, a whole nother podcast, which we've talked about many times before. Um yeah. But we vilified it. But yeah, all, all of our sex hormones are made from cholesterol. So without cholesterol, we would die. Our brain is high in cholesterol. Without cholesterol, we would not be sharp and, and be able to mentally focus. Cholesterol is so important for every cell in the body. So it should not be vilified. Um, oh. Speaking of your family and, and eating red meat. Um, so we I, I have two grown boys, big boys, um, six, three, six, four. One's 235, one's 210. And they're both, they're 23 and 21. They don't live with us any longer. They live in our same town. And one of the things that we told them when they moved out was that, you know, you are welcome to raid our freezer for meat because we've always had a freezer full of meat. So we go through and it's just Janet and I. And Janet and I travel a lot, so we don't eat at home as much. Um, we go through a full beef every four months. Fantastic. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. <laughs> You are putting that cow to work. That cow is working for you. Right, right. Now, I also think of that. Now, think of the think about just uh, rationally about how many calories are in a full beef, how, and, and the nutrients. Honestly, people that are listening and watching, think about how you'd have to eat a house full of plants to get as much calories and nutrients that are in a beef. A full, a full, a full cow. Seriously. And here's an example. You know, when people say, well, you know, a gorilla, a gorilla is, is mostly vegan, maybe, maybe pure vegan. I don't know if they're, if they're, um, I don't think they eat any meat. I think they're an obligate, um, herbivore, but you know how much, and they, and they eat mostly bamboo and look at a gorilla. They're big and strong. I'm like, yeah. Do you know how much bamboo a gorilla eats every day? 40 pounds. Four zero pounds. Our digestive system could never handle that. A, a, a gorilla has a different digestive system than we do. They've got a lot longer digestive system to to di digest all that um, fiber. We, we forty pounds. Imagine eating forty pounds of bamboo, which is a plant, a day to get as big as a gorilla. No, thank you. 
awful. That just sounds so awful. Right, right. <laughs> I love using that analogy. So that's a great analogy. Well, I'm thinking too, we have two pygmy goats. I have two little pygmy goats. Their names are Duke and Delilah. I love going out there and just watching those little goats play. But what do they do? Every time I walk out to my backyard, those goats are eating. They're eating grass all day, every day. They yep. never stop. That's their life. <laughs> that you look at any herbivore, what do you see when you drive by them? Whether it's a horse, whether it's a cow, whether it's a deer, they're always eating. And and what does what does a lion do most of the day? Sleep. They sleep twenty <laughs> hours a day, and then they hunt, you know, two or three days a week and feast, and then they sleep. A good life. <laughs> good life. <laughs> right. So as we wrap this podcast up, Jennifer, this has been wonderful. I love having you on. Thanks for all your knowledge and wisdom. <clears throat> um, I want to ask you a question. What do you have a passion for? Well, I d are we talking professionally or personally? No, no, you just tell me. What's the first thing that pops your mind when you say you have a pa what, what's your passion? Hormones. Hormones are definitely my passion. Like that is what drives me. So I am, I love, love, love women's hormones. That is my professional passion. Now on the personal side, um, I, well, I really love watching my kids. My kids are very athletic. So watching their sports are lots of fun, but myself, I am a big pickleball player. So that is something that we've been doing a lot over the past couple of years. I don't miss my Friday game with my girlfriends, no matter how busy I am. That's awesome. But pickleball, I, I gotta, I played it way long time ago in high school and it was very fun and boy that is gaining traction oh, every yeah. every resort we, we do a lot of mountain biking every mountain bike resort we go to or or wherever we travel there's a pickleball court now and it's packed with people playing families playing pickleball it must, it must be super fun it's just so much fun yeah we got a court at our house we go out and play all the time it's just a great way to you know blow off steam and and hang out with family and friends so it's definitely it's definitely a joy recently in my life so if our listeners and viewers wanted to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Awesome. So you can definitely find more about functional diagnostic nutrition. That is my certification at functionaldiagnosticnutrition.com. My personal website is jenniferwoodwardnutrition.com. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Um, but we'd love to see you over at FDN. That's our founder, Reed Davis, right there. Awesome guy. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jennifer, you have definitely helped us realize our goal today, which is to educate and empower individuals to take charge of their own health. So I so appreciate you being on today. Your passion is hormones. So is mine. So is my wife. That's what we do all day long is talk hormones to people like yourself and to patients and to other healthcare professionals. And we would love to have you on again. So let's stay in touch. That'd be wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. What a joy and pleasure to be here today. Thanks, Sean. You're welcome. And I do not know who our new guest is uh, or who our guest is coming up on our podcast Monday, but stay tuned for our regularly scheduled podcast, which is 1230 to 1.30 Pacific Standard Time Monday. It's going to be a super cool show, I am sure. And Jennifer, thank you so much for being on. Listeners and viewers, thank you for tuning in. Um, I appreciate it. Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Thank you.